London news agents. Miss Truss, Tommy Robinson was described as a hero in front of you. Why didn't you speak up? Miss Truss, do you think Tommy Robinson is a hero? Miss Truss, is describing the civil service and journalists as the deep state really responsible? And Liz Truss is back in London, in Westminster. And if you think her microphone wasn't faded up, it's not that. She just stood there grinning as these questions were being asked of her and carried on walking with this big grin. And next to her was her special advisor. I do commend you look at it. He is wearing a thick Cossack hat and looking very stern as they walk along. Frankly, the whole scene was utterly bonkers. Because <laughs> we are in Gorky Park in minus 20. But the person who's really happy to see Liz Truss back in London is none other than Keir Starmer. Liz Truss has become, and will probably remain, his best line of attack on Rishi Sunak, following those, frankly, extraordinary comments she made at the Conservative Conference in America last week. We're going to be discussing whether she's now too big a headache for Rishi Sunak to ignore. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. And we were wondering what Keir Starmer would go on at Prime Minister's questions uh, today, because frankly, there's been an awful lot to talk about because of Lee Anderson and everything else. Actually, I thought it was pretty smart to go on Liz Truss and her contribution that she made at the CPAC conference uh, last week, just outside Washington, which is kind of where the uber MAGA crowd now go to gather. And what Keir Starmer is trying to do is he's trying to get a long piece of rope and tie that piece of rope around Rishi Sunak's ankle and attach it to Liz Truss's and make them inseparable in the minds of the British people going forward to the election. There's a new Ipsos poll out today, um, a sort of public poll, which may have been put in front of Keir Starmer's eyes, landed on his desk, which shows that, according to this one, he is now Britain's most favourable politician on 30%, and the least favourable politician is Liz Truss on 8%. In actual fact, it's the unfavourability number that you want to look at in that column. Liz Truss has an unfavourability rating that is higher than anyone else they polled at nearly 70%. So I think that's right. He has to work out a way now to tie Liz Truss and her words and deeds in Washington last week to the current leader of the Conservative Party and ask Rishi Sunak whether he endorses what she said, endorses what she stands for, or whether he's going to kick her out. Well, I think it's really interesting that what Keir Starmer is doing here, because on the one hand, Rishi Sunak wants to say, I've got nothing to do with Liz Truss. That was before I became prime minister. Keir Starmer wants the whole record yeah. of the Conservatives since they took power in 2010 to be on the ballot whenever this general election is called. And the greatest recruiting sergeant there is is what happened when Liz Truss was catastrophically Prime Minister for 49 days. Liz Truss, though, is not going quietly. She is going very noisily into the future. She's got a book coming out that's going to cause waves. And she was at the CPAC conference. And I, I mean, it is a tradition of a Prime Minister and an ex-Foreign Secretary, which is what she is, not to intervene in foreign affairs of another country. You are there to support Britain when you are abroad, except listen to this of her at CPAC last week. Joe Biden needs to be kicked out of the White House. Yeah. I think that is vital for the future of the West. And I have worked in the cabinet under both the Trump presidency as trade yep. secretary and the Biden secretary as for Biden as foreign when yep. I was foreign secretary. And I'll tell you, I felt safer for the West when President Trump was in power. So she's walking straight into a political battle there that she's happy and prepared to have. She was standing on stage with Steve Bannon, the kind of MAGA embodiment, I think also convicted criminal, and she was there to talk about the conspiracy theories that had brought her down, the deep state economist she didn't mention us this time financial no times time. financial times all these evil bodies that as we know run the uk run and destroy the uk um that were part of liz truss's downfall and there was also a moment 
where Steve Bannon heralded another convicted convict, maybe this little club there going on, of the uh, right-wing extremist uh, Stephen Yaxley Lennon, known to his fans as Tommy Robinson, and called him a hero. Just listen to the bit of Steve Bannon. Nigel Farage said yesterday that you're going to have a radical Islamic party have seats in commons in the next election. Do you believe that's true? Well, there's going to be a by-election in the next few weeks, and it could be a radical Islamic party win in that by-election. So that is a possibility. You're saying an Islamic radical party in a couple of weeks in a special election is in one of these Midland urban uh, areas that had the... Rochdale. So it's an urban area in the north of England. But it's the one that's had the the rape situation? Yes. The grooming situation? Yes. Hang on, I don't understand this. The grooming situation, Tommy Robinson, all these heroes fought it. The rape situation, and in that community, you're going to have a special election, and you may have a radical jihadist party send somebody to commons after all that problem. That is correct. So she doesn't at any point contradict the view uh, that Tommy Robinson is uh, maybe not the sort of person you want to be uh, having a cup of tea with. I mean, did we say he's a right wing extremist from a sort of fascist party? I think we did, right? We did. did. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that was kind of the lack of reaction to that from the high ups in the Conservative Party are thinking, oh, my God, what's she done now? Probably. But thinking, can we do anything about it? No. Well, that gave Keir Starmer his opening in the Commons debate. Tory MP spent last week claiming that Britain is run by a shadowy cabal made up of activists, the deep state, and most chillingly of all, the Financial Times. <laughs> at, at what point did his party give up on governing and become the political wing of the Flat Earth Society? Yeah. Well, m- m- Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, another week where the Honourable Member is just sniping from the sidelines because he has absolutely nothing that he can say what we do. What we're getting on with, Mr Speaker, is delivering on the people's priorities the number of small boats down by a third, Mr Speaker. Now, the trouble, I think, with Rishi Sunak's position is that the same question about Liz Truss has been levelled at him as the one about Lee Anderson. Do you want this person representing your party, your views in your parliament? And we know that he suspended Lee Anderson. And there will be many, I think, who believe that Lee Anderson was far more. And there'll be many, I think, who believe that Lee Anderson's comments, yes, may have been Islamophobic. Yes, may have been racist, but were actually less unhinged than the stuff that Liz Truss, a former Prime Minister, and just to remind you, current sitting MP for South West Norfolk, is coming out with in a foreign country. And so I think that lands on Rishi Sunak's plate in a week where he has had to take action against Lee Anderson and hasn't taken action, because in a way, how can he, against his predecessor. Or Suella Braverman, for that matter, who wrote an article uh, in The Telegraph talking about how the Islamists had taken over Britain. I mean, at least Lee Anderson was saying it was only London that had been taken yeah, over by really the Islamists. quite a moderate. But really, Suella thinks it's the whole of Britain that's been taken over by them. And so you kind of, you keep getting more and more questions <laughs> piling up. Why this one and not that one, Rishi? Yeah. Why has this one had the whip withdrawn, but not the other? And those questions are going to keep coming. And they kept coming today uh, on the radio when you can imagine ministers are just desperate to move on from this. And they can't. This is Chris Philp, the policing minister. Why is it that Number 10 Downing Street doesn't want anybody representing them to come on television and say that his comments were racist? Critically, the Prime Minister withdrew the whip, right? He withdrew the whip almost immediately. That is a contrast to the dithering which we saw from Keir Starmer when he had that incident in Rochdale, he's when it not, took him days and days and days. He's not withdrawn the whip from Liz Truss, well, he's, though. He's not withdrawn the, lip from, uh, the whip from Liz Truss, should he? No. Why not? Because I don't think she's done anything wrong. She didn't step in when the person on the stage with her said that Tommy Robinson was a hero. Yeah, well, he's clearly not. Um, but I don't think you can attack someone for a sin of omission. And we don't know what the circumstances of that she were. She also criticised the Conservative Party and supported other parties, which is also against the rules. 
Uh, well, I haven't heard that quote. I mean, she's a Conservative and I'm sure she'll be campaigning as hard as the rest of us for a Conservative government to uh, stop the Labour Party. You have clearly got no plan whatsoever from winning the next election. Yeah, I mean, Chris Philp just wanting to shut down that whole question of whether they're actually going to start hunting out everyone who's saying slightly cranky, or in Keir Starmer's words, tinfoil hat things in the Conservative Party, because otherwise that could be a full-time job, quite frankly. And I think there is an argument to say that Keir Starmer, given where we are and given all that's going on, there is a lot of other stuff he could have asked about today. You know, he could have asked about the post office. He could have asked about the delayed compensation. He could have looked at GPs and waiting lists and, and, and crime and all the rest of it. But I think we've got to a place now where this is just becoming, at least at Prime Minister's questions, really easy for Starmer. Because all he has to do is say, look at the weakness that is embodied in Rishi Sunak right now, because he's a man who doesn't really know which wing of his party to listen to. The only thing I would say about that is that I still think there are questions that Starmer has to answer as a politician about what Labour would do in government. And I think what we've learnt is pretty much what they won't do or what they're no longer going to do, which we thought was clear. And, you know, we started talking on the podcast a few moments ago about this poll, about the favourability rating of the various politicians. And you said that Keir Starmer is the most popular. Yes, but he has also got a net unfavourability rating. He is the least unfavourable. He is the least disliked of the po current crop of politicians. But he ain't Mother Teresa out there. He hasn't got huge popularity ratings at the moment. And I think that that would be a concern uh, for Labour. It should be a concern for all the politicians, frankly, that none of them have got net favourability at all. They're all net unfavourable. And that is a problem for Keir Starmer. And so, yeah, easy for him to go on Tory weakness and Tory division because it's there. But I still think he needs to do more. I think Keir Starmer is finding out that the less you have to reveal about your own position, the safer you are in the popularity stakes. Because as soon as you commit to something, and I mean, this is something we've talked about before, but I was told almost a year ago by a kind of Labour grandee that there's no reason for Keir Starmer to lay out anything that's got a spending tag on it. And sure enough, that's where he's come to now. Don't mention prices, don't mention commitments, don't mention big borrowing or investment projects. You take all that out. At the moment, I think he's, he's playing the political, the campaigning game, which is, do you really want this man who can't decide whether he likes Liz Truss, who can't decide what Lee Anderson's done wrong, who can't actually send anyone out to make sense of his current party position, do you really want him as your leader? That all changes next Wednesday. Yeah. When Jeremy Hunt stands up and delivers the budget. Yeah. And we see where the tax priorities are and what the spending totals are going to be. It's the last full budget before a general election. After that, Starmer has got no excuse not to come out with the details because those are the figures on which both parties are going to be fighting the general yeah. election. If there are tax cuts and actually... It, by all sounds of it, those tax cuts are sort of disappearing before our eyes. If he does find ways of cutting the taxes in people's pockets, then I think the spotlight instantly goes on Labour. Because as you say, it's probably that last budget. What are you keeping and what's going? You've seen it now. What are you keeping and what's going? And that becomes a problem, potentially a headache for them too. And just to add a postscript to all of this, we thought today was going to be all about Sir Lindsay Hoyle yeah. and whether he could survive or not and whether this was With 84 be votes against him 84 votes him. against him a critical mass and actually it seemed like a rather normal Prime Minister's questions and you would think crisis what crisis but that is still bubbling away in a moment we'll be back talking policing and protest and whether we've had enough of the Palestine demonstrations there's been an interesting intervention in the midst of all the heat around Palestine from the Home Secretary James Cleverley nothing Islamophobic, just raising the question about the protests that have been taking place in London and other cities around the country every other week now since October the 7th and whether that's enough. Can we just stop the protest please? Because one, it's costing an awful lot in terms of policing and two, frankly, 
the protest is the same as it was two weeks ago. So why do we need to have another protest where police resources are diverted away from something else onto the streets of London to keep these protests safe? James Cleverly has been in the US over the last few days and he gave this interview in New York to the Times correspondent there. And obviously we don't know the ins and outs of the conversation that preceded it, but I can just imagine that he was probably asked, almost certainly asked, about Lee Anderson and whether it was Islamophobic and whether those comments were racist. And James Cleverly probably thought he was finding a way of answering the bigger issue without getting himself stuck in the tautology of what wrong meant. And what he said to the Times was, I think the organisers should recognise they've made their point, they've made it loudly, and they're not adding to it by repeating themselves. Now, that might be his own personal view, that he now understands what the sort of pro-Palestine, the Gaza protesters are saying. But obviously, he is the Home Secretary. And as soon as a politician wades into a place of telling protesters whether they can or cannot, should or shouldn't, carry on protesting about something that they feel incredibly strongly about, it is going to get a lot of people's backs up. And what he did was make the point that it was all about policing. It was all about the money, the cost, the expenditure on policing at a time when, you know, obviously resources are stretched. But I think this will be seen by many who defend the rights of protesters to go and make their voices felt until they feel they've been heard really angry. Yesterday on the podcast, we did uh, the, an interview with Paul Scully, who kind of made a mess of talking about no-go areas in London, when he was trying to be a moderate voice on this and got it wrong. We've had Suella Braverman, when she was Home Secretary, talking about hate marches and it being populated, these demos being populated by Islamists and it should be banned from uh, Armistice Day weekend and all the rest of it, which actually had a massive counterproductive effect with the far right coming out onto the streets and causing mayhem. Um, and I think James Cleverly was trying to steer, I think quite artfully, actually, a more centrist course, not to say there is anything wrong with the protests, just we're tired now. Can we have a rest? I'm sure it's not going to get anywhere. The police are not going to ban the protest because I think that would be, again, massively counterproductive. It was to try to strike a different tone on, come on, guys, haven't we had enough of this yet? I think it will probably have the adverse effect, which is if you're a protester and you've just heard the Home Secretary say, yeah, all right, we get it, enough already, then you've probably got your placard down from the you know, top of the cupboard and off you go again. It's kind of given a new sort of sail to your wind. I mean, the question about when a protest has done its job is a really interesting one, because if I look back to 2022, Right. I went on all the Ukraine protests, you know, the, the sort of anti-Russian invasion Ukraine protests. And those were huge and they were they were kind of astonishing. They were magnificent and they were, you know, blue and yellow filling the whole of central London. And I, I felt really proud, you know, to be a sort of part of that. It's the first time I've been on a protest, actually, since because we couldn't protest at the BBC. And that felt like something that I wanted to be a part of. And then they kind of ended as quickly as they as they came. And it's not like. Thousands aren't dying in Ukraine. It's not like Putin's actions aren't intensifying, you know, as we go on. So when is when is a protest enough? It's a really good point. I guess the point is that the, the British government at that point heard what people were saying or were very happy to take actions and sanctions against Putin. And we want to see the same now against the Netanyahu government. I mean, you could just consider the hypothetical situation. What if... And no one is suggesting this, but, you know, just purely hypothetically, what if the protesters say we want to protest every day of the week in London now? We want to bring thousands of people every day onto the streets to protest. When does the government say, well, actually, the cost of policing this is now getting exorbitant and we can't support that? Now, is that stopping the right to protest or is that just making a common sense decision about kind of governance and mm. the, the safety of people but, moving about their daily business. Yeah, and the opposite of that is what happens if the government said, yeah, 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 we've heard what you said, you signed a petition. No protest, thanks. We don't want any protest. We get it. We heard it. And then you've got protesters 
protesting against the fact that they can't protest, which is actually where we're going to come to in a moment. We're going to speak to Sam Grant, who's the Advocacy Director of Liberty, who tells us that they are taking their case to the High Court against Suella Braverman's change in the law to make it harder for people to protest. She's lowering the bar to what constitutes an actual protest. But first, we're going to hear from Helen King. And she's got a more nuanced take on what it's like to be in the middle of having to make those decisions because she is actually the former assistant commissioner of the Met. And Helen, do you have sympathy with what the Home Secretary is calling for today? I think policing protests is a really complex and difficult issue. Um, And as a former public order commander, where you start from is not what politicians are saying to you, not what the headlines are. You start with the information and intelligence that you've got from threats to life, you know, to allowing people to go about their lawful business, obviously um, putting facilitating peaceful process as a really high priority. But you are balancing a lot of different issues. And I think politicians and, you know, most members of the public will not see the complexity behind the decision making that uh, is having to be made. Um, And my experience is the closer that people can get to that, the more they realise that there aren't perfect answers and that actually all the training, all the experience of the the police officers who are trying to make these really difficult decisions, it's probably best that they're allowed to get on with it. We have had now every other week a protest that is broadly the same as the protest from two weeks ago. And I suppose the point the Home Secretary is making is this is an awful lot of police overtime. This is an awful lot of money that is resources being diverted for the same protest. Can't we just say enough is enough? I think human rights probably don't work that way. But I do absolutely recognise the impact it's having. I think people, when they see those police officers who are on protests, imagine that there's a kind of bucket of public order officers that you can bring them out for these events. Those police officers are the same ones who are also prioritising neighbourhood policing where you're trying to build local communities' confidence, prioritising responding to emergency calls. You're stripping out boroughs across London. um, And I imagine that that the Met may also be using mutual aid, so pulling in police officers from other forces. So there is a direct impact on the wider public And trying to balance something as fundamental as the right to protest with this um, gradual, I suppose, kind of leeching over time of wider impact, which is much harder to measure, but nonetheless less real. And of course, the police officers are getting exhausted as as well. They're getting their rest days cancelled and they're not able to get on with those those investigations and their usual day-to-day duties too. I'm wondering, Helen, what that feels like. I mean, when you know that when you have to put more police on the streets for a protest, that there is going to be, I don't know, an uptick in burglaries in the places where there aren't police or an uptick in in smaller crime or maybe it's domestic crime or maybe it's um, police not getting to situations that are emergencies quickly enough. I mean, what is that like to have to, I guess, see that coming down the tracks? At one level, it's frustrating, and it's particularly frustrating, I guess, when um, politicians and others don't recognise that, in effect, you're playing whack-a-mole. You know, one week, the priority is um, policing protests. The next week, it's uh, rape investigations. The next week, it's uh, neighbourhood policing and community confidence. And, you know, your resources do get stretched. Mm. On the other hand, you know, and I've said this in briefings to to police officers that we're sending out on on protest operations, you're also thinking about what kind of society do I want to live in? And I think most of us want to live in a democracy, want to live in a society where people can assemble, can express their views. Um, And there isn't a perfect balance. But trying to clamp down on protests, you know, we have a, a tendency to say, well, let's pass a law and say that this isn't allowed. Is that actually going to stop people from gathering or is it going to make it an even more volatile situation? Can I come at it another way, which is that the Stop the War protester this morning said, actually, these protests are over-policed, that if you've only got, I don't know, 12 arrests 
on a protest, the same number as might get arrested, you know, in Oxford Street, you do not need 150,000 police. Well, it's not so very long ago that the police were being criticised for not intervening more readily. If you intervene and you carry out one arrest, that takes a number of police officers out of the policing operation for hours while that person is processed, is taken to a custody suite, is dealt with. So 16 arrests could easily take up um, several dozen police officers, take them out of that operation. Your intelligence may be saying that you're expecting more widespread violence or damage. Um, and you need to make sure that everyone involved in that protest, whether it's the protesters, whether it's counter protesters, whether it's the police officers, whether it's shoppers and tourists who are also in the area, can be kept safe. And I suppose there's the counterfactual there, which is that if there were next to no police officers there, there may be all sorts of problems that would arise. And it's only because there is a strong police presence that there are so few arrests. I mean, it's back to the, the Pelian idea that um, the effectiveness of policing should be measured by the absence of crime. And when you see these protests characterised, as a number of politicians have done, of calling them hate marches, what do you think of that? It certainly can be seen as incendiary language. What you've got to recognise that you you talk about a protest as an entity, but in a major protest, there will be more than one group there. There will be more than one type of person. There are clearly lots of people who are there motivated by their sincerely held um, beliefs who want to exercise the right to peaceful protest. And then you may have subgroups that are intent on, on breaking the law, on being incendiary, on stirring up divisions. Um, the police will work with the organisers, but neither the police nor the organisers can absolutely control what happens. So interesting. It's really good to get this perspective. Um, Helen, thank you so much for joining us. Not at all. <laughs> thanks care. a lot. Bye. All the best. Many thanks. We're joined in the studio by Sam Grant, Advocacy Director from Liberty. So lots of people will at some point be inconvenienced by a protest. We would argue that the, the restrictions have, have tipped the balance far too far away from the right to protest. And I think there's also an interesting point to make that the, the less space there is for protest, you are perhaps pushing people into more extreme and disruptive measures to make their voices heard. Just unpack that, that's quite interesting. So if people feel that they haven't got the space to protest, mm. then they think, well, if I'm going to break the law, I'm just going to break the law however I want, mm -hmm. or whether it's stopping traffic or holding up a bridge or, you know, um, gluing my hands to something. Do you think that's making protesters more extreme? I, I would question how much the protest restrictions are stopping that, very committed core of people who are going around who who are intent on making their point heard through direct action um but i also think when we're talking about protests we do need to move back just from talking about the recent environmental protests um and actually that there's a long history of very disruptive protests from from going back to the suffragettes to apartheid the the point i'd make to people who are concerned about the impact of, of protest um, on their daily lives is actually you never know when you're going to be protesting about something and protest is such an essential important right that's interweaved into um, democracy and, and the rights that we all hold that you know if you're it could be anything from from foreign policy to campaigning against the closure of your local library and the more that we see that that space narrowing for protest um, the, the more worried we should be about those occasions where you might feel like you want to go and protest about something. Is the Home Secretary right when he says the Gaza protesters have made their point and what we're seeing now is a huge extra burden and expense on policing in the capital? You know, his, his thing is, we get it, now you can go home. I f think that is a fundamental misunderstanding of protest and, and protest movements. People turn up to protest because they don't feel like they are being listened to or they they want to see action. Um, and fundamentally, those those asks are not being met or believe 
or perceived to be met. So how often, how far do you go if people want to protest every day? Should we be providing police, you know, 150,000 police every time people want to protest? I mean, I guess that's what we're weighing up here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it goes back to, you know, this is absolutely a balance. Um, and we would argue that that balance has tipped much further away from the right to protest over, over the last few years. Um, and that's concerning in terms of the direction of travel. There are a whole swathe of restrictions on protest that that dictate when, where, for how long you can protest. Um, we need to avoid knee-jerk reactions to um, protests that are happening at the moment um, and understand that actually protest is already, you know, intimately policed um, and we should be really wary of any um, pushes for further restrictions and further legislation. And Sam, let me just come back to the case that you're bringing at the yes. High Court today. Is there any chance that a judge is going to overturn what the Home Secretary did using statutory instruments? Because then, actually, statutory instruments become meaningless to a government minister. They've operated within the law. You may not like the way she's done it, mm. but it's within the law. We wouldn't take the case if we didn't think there was a chance that the judge may feel that what the Home Secretary did was um, undermining parliamentary sovereignty. You know, of, as I said, um, this, this was an explicit change in law that was rejected by Parliament and then two months later passed by statutory instrument which was just nodded through in Parliament. I think since 1950, 99.9% .9 of statutory instruments have, have passed. Um, they are a far less democratic way of, of making law. They have their place. Um, but when we're talking about something so fundamental um, as the, the right to protest, we don't think it is an appropriate way to, to make law and, and changes to our rights. Have you talked to um, Keir Starmer? Do you know what an incoming... Labour government might do to this law if they said that they would repeal it to you? We, we don't know what Labour will, will do on this on this on the specific regulations. Uh, we'll, we'd be urging any future government to really take stock of the direction of travel that, that we've gone on on protest rights. Um, we would you know we would like to see this law repealed but we'd also like to see a change in direction um, and rhetoric towards protest. Sam Thank you so much for coming in Thanks. and explaining it to us. Thanks really for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Before we go, we've got to talk Michigan. Why are we talking Michigan? Well, because there was the primary last night and it was a big test for Joe Biden in a certain way and a big test for Donald Trump in a certain way. And actually, I've got a feeling that it leaves both of them with a little bit of a headache. Yeah. If you heard us yesterday talking about Joe Biden's ice cream discussion of an imminent ceasefire deal in the Middle East, we were starting to tell you a little bit about why Michigan matters. And you can hear a full detailed understanding of that on the news agents USA, which we just published overnight. But essentially, the Michigan primary is quite an interesting one because Michigan has a very large Arab American population, Muslim American population, around 150,000. And yesterday there was jeopardy for Joe Biden because there is a movement now. Think of it as a kind of stop the war movement or a sort of, uh, I don't know, a sort of extinction rebellion movement, but it's called uncommitted. And it and it is made up of people who are trying to change the president's stance on Israel and want to see him stand up to the Netanyahu government and act more forcibly. And last night, overnight, 45,000 people who would naturally have voted for Biden, who would naturally be more on the Democrat side of things, wrote uncommitted on their ballot paper. And that, in a state like Michigan, is enough to swing a state. So when Democrats go to their convention in August, it's possible now, as a result of what happened in Michigan uh, last night, there will be uncommitted delegates yeah. 
turning up. If they've got above 15 percent in certain districts, they will get delegates to go to the convention to be uncommitted, which sounds. Yeah. One of the districts uh, where there was a lot of uncommitted is the one that belongs to Rashida Talib. Now, she is one of what we call the squad, the very progressive, very left wing kind of thorns in the side to Joe Biden. And she is herself an Arab American woman. And that might be why she has been able to kind of pull together this very strong kind of anti-Biden feeling or certainly anti-Israel feeling on the ballot, which just reminds Biden that it's not all going to be plain sailing come the convention. So Biden's numbers were actually pretty good last night in that he got something like 82 percent of uh, the delegate vote. Um, Trump, on the other hand, was fighting Nikki Haley. And yeah, won again by a big margin, 70 to 30. So if you want to put a positive spin on that, you say there is absolutely no doubt that Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee come November's election. The negative spin on that is, even though it is so clear that Trump is going to be the victor, there are still 30 percent of Republicans who are thinking, I don't want that. I don't want I don't want Trump. I'm happy with Nikki Haley. I do not want Donald Trump. How he gets those people on board is a really big question. And that's why Michigan was actually very interesting. Last yeah. Night. If you think of them now as both the incumbents for their own party and you put those side by side, then Biden is getting 82 percent of Democrats. Trump is only getting around 70 percent of Republicans. And that's where the general election race starts to look a little bit more vital and in play. So a lot more on that on News Agents USA. And let me point you in the direction of our special question and answer uh, podcast, which is available exclusively on Global Player. No money for free. It's there. Go and join us. Bye for now. Bye See bye. you tomorrow. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 